Instead of bringing goods and valuables, ships crisscrossing the Mediterranean brought death and devastation. Infection was not only spread by contact with plague victims or by the rats, which were always a feature of maritime travel. Even the goods in the hold turned into lethal cargoes as fleas infested furs and food destined for mainland Europe, as well as for ports in Egypt, the Levant, and Cyprus, where the first victims tended to be infants and the young. Soon the disease had been transmitted along the caravan route to reach Mecca, killing scores of pilgrims and scholars and provoking serious soul-searching. The Prophet Muhammad had supposedly promised that the plague which ravished Mesopotamia in the 7th century would never enter the holy cities of Islam. In Damascus, wrote Ibn al-Wardi, the plague sat like a king on a throne and swayed with power, killing daily 1,000 or more and decimating the population. The roads between Cairo and Palestine were littered with the bodies of victims, while dogs tore at the corpses piled up against the walls of mosques in Bilbais. In the regions of Upper Egypt, meanwhile, the number of taxpayers fell from 6,000 before the Black Death to just 116, a fall of 98%, although such population contractions may also reflect people fleeing their homes, there can be little doubt that the death toll was enormous. All the wisdom and ingenuity of man was powerless to prevent the spread of disease, wrote Bocasio, the Italian humanist scholar, in his introduction to the Decameron. In the space of three months, he noted, more than 100,000 lost their lives in Florence alone. Venice was all but depopulated. Accounts agreed that no less than three-quarters of its citizens died during the outbreak. To many, it seemed to signal the end of the world. In Ireland, one Franciscan monk concluded his account of the ravages caused by plague by leaving blank space for continuing my work in case anyone should still be alive in the future. There was a sense of impending apocalypse. In France, chroniclers reported that it rained frogs, snakes, lizards, scorpions, and many other similar poisonous animals. There were signs from the sky that made God's displeasure clear. Enormous hailstones struck the earth, killing people by the dozen, while towns and villages burnt down after being set ablaze by thunderbolts that produced stinking smoke. Some, like the King of England, Edward III, turned to fasting and prayer, with Edward ordering his bishops to follow suit. Arabic handbooks written about 1350 provided guides for the Muslim faithful to do much the same, advising that saying a specific prayer 11 times would help, and that chanting verses relating to the life of Muhammad would provide protection from boils. In Rome, solemn processions were held where the penitent and fearful marched barefoot in hair shirts, uh, flagellating themselves to show contrition for their sins. These were among the least creative efforts to appease God's wrath. Avoid sex and every fleshly lust with women, urged one priest in Sweden, and for that matter also do not bathe and avoid the south wind, at least until lunchtime. If this was a case of hoping for the best, then a counterpart in England was at least rather more direct. Women should wear different clothes, urged one English priest for their own sake as well as that of everyone else. The outlandish and revealing outfits they had got used to sporting were simply asking for divine punishment. The trouble had started when they began to wear useless little hoods laced and buttoned so tightly at the throat that they only covered the shoulders. That was not all, for in addition they wore other things, extremely short garments, for example, which failed to conceal their arses or their private parts. Apart from anything else, these mishappen and tight clothes did not allow them to kneel to God or to the other saints. Wild rumors circulated in Germany that the disease was not natural, but the result of Jews poisoning wells and rivers. Vicious pogroms were carried out, with one account reporting how all the Jews between Cologne and Austria were rounded up and burned alive. So bad were the outbreaks of anti-Semitism that the Pope intervened, issuing proclamations forbidding any violent action against the Jewish populations in any Christian country and demanding that their goods and assets be left unmolested. Whether this was effective or not was another matter. 
It was not the first time, after all, that fear of disaster, hardship, and excessive religious outpourings resulted in the widespread slaughter of the Jewish minority in Germany. There had been terrible suffering in the Rhinelands at the time of the First Crusade, when circumstances were not dissimilar. It was dangerous to have different beliefs at times of crisis. Europe lost at least one-third of its population to the plague, and perhaps much more, with conservative estimates of the number of dead placed somewhere around the 25 million mark, and an assumed total population of 75 million. Work on more recent epidemics of plague has also demonstrated that during large outbreaks, small villages and rural areas report much higher levels of death than cities. It seems that the key determinant of spreading plague is not the density of the human population, as has usually been thought, but that of rat colonies. The disease does not spread any more quickly in a packed urban environment where there are more households per infected rodent colony than in the countryside. Escaping from cities and towns for the countryside did not in fact increase one's chances of cheating death. From field to farm and city to village, the Black Death created hell on earth, putrid, rotting bodies, oozing with pus, setting against a background of fear, anxiety, and disbelief at the scale of suffering. The effects were crushing. Our hopes for the future have been buried alongside our friends, wrote the Italian poet Petrarch. Plans and ambitions for further discovery of the East and for fortunes to be made were overshadowed by darker thoughts. The only consolation, Petrarch went on, was the knowledge that we shall follow those who went before. I do not know how long we will have to wait, but I know it cannot be very long. All the riches of the Indian Ocean, the Caspian or the Black Sea, he wrote, would not make up for what had been swept away. And yet, despite the horror it caused, the plague turned out to be the catalyst for social and economic change that was so profound that far from marking the death of Europe, it served as its making. The transformation pr provided an important pillar in the rise and the triumph of the West. It did so in several phases. First was the top-to-bottom reconfiguration of how social structures functioned. Chronic depopulation in the wake of the Black Death had the effect of sharply increasing wages because of the accentuated value of labor. So many died before the plague finally began to peter out in the early 1350s that one source noted a shortage of servants, craftsmen, and workmen, and agricultural workers and laborers. This gave considerable negotiating powers to those who had previously been at the lower end of the social and economic spectrum. Some simply turned their noses up at employment and could scarcely be persuaded to serve the eminent unless for triple wages. This was hardly an exaggeration. Empirical data shows that urban wages rose dramatically in the decades after the Black Death. The empowerment of the peasantry, the laborers of and of women, was matched by a weakening of the propertied classes as landlords were forced into accepting lower rents for their holdings, deciding it was better to receive some revenue than nothing at all. Lower rents, few, fewer obligations, and longer leases all had the effect of tilting power and benefits towards the peasantry and urban tenants. This was further enhanced by a fall in interest rates, which declined noticeably across Europe in the 14th and 15th centuries. The results were remarkable. With wealth now more evenly distributed through society, demand for luxury goods, imported or otherwise, soared as a result of more consumers being able to purchase items than had previously been unaffordable. unaffordable. Spending patterns were affected by other demographic changes that the plague had produced, notably the shift in favor of the working young, who were best placed to take advantage of new opportunities opening up, opening up before them. Already less disposed to saving because of their clothes sh shaved with deaths, the new up-and-coming generation, better paid than their parents and with better prospects for the future, set about spending their wealth on things they were interested in, not least of which was fashion. This in turn stimulated investment in and the rapid development of a European textile industry that began to turn out fabrics in such volume that they had a major impact on the trade in Alexandria as imports fell sharply. Europe had began to export in the opposite direction too, flooding the market in the Middle East and causing a painful contraction that stood in direct contrast to the invigorated economy to the West. As recent research based on skeletal remains in graveyards in London demonstrates, the rise in wealth led to better diets and to better general health. Indeed, statistical modeling based on these results give 
even suggests that one of the effects of the plague was a substantial improvement in life expectancy. London's post-plague population was considerably healthier than it had been before the Black Death struck, raising life expectancy sharply. Economic and social development did not occur evenly across Europe. Change took place most rapidly in the north and the northwest of the continent, partly because this region was starting from a lower economic point than the more developed south. This meant that the interests of landlord and tenant were more closely aligned and therefore more likely to end in collaboration and in solutions that suited both parties. It was also significant, however, that, in the, that the cities in the north did not carry the same ideological and political baggage as many of those in the Mediterranean. Centuries of regional and long-term commerce had created institutions such as guilds that controlled, controlled competition and were designed to hand monopolistic positions to defined groups of individuals. Northern Europe, by contrast, began to boom precisely because competition was not restricted, causing urbanization and economic growth to happen at a markedly faster rate than in the South. Different behavioral profiles also emerged across different parts of Europe. In Italy, for example, women were either less tempted or were less able to enter the labor markets and continued to marry at the same age and to have as many children as before the outbreak of plague. This contrasted sharply with the situation in the northern countries, where the demographic contraction gave women the chance to become wage earners. One effect of this was to raise the age at which women tended to get married, which in turn had longer-term implications for family sizes. Don't hurdle into marriage too soon, advised Anna Bejans in a poem written in the Low Countries, for one who earns her hoard, her board and clothes shouldn't scurry to suffer a man's rod. Though wedlock I do not decry, unyoked is best. Happy the woman without man. The transformations triggered by the Black Death laid foundations that were to prove crucial for the long-term rise of northwestern Europe. Although the effects of the divergence between parts of Europe would take time to evolve, the system, sy systemic flexibility, the openness to competition, and perhaps most importantly of all, the sense of awareness in the North that geography counted against them and that a strong work ethic was required in order to turn a profit, all laid the basis for the latter transformation of the European economies in the early modern period. As modern research is increasingly making clear, the roots of the Industrial Revolution of the 18th century and beyond lay in the Industrious Revolution of the post-plague world. As productivity rose, aspirations were cast upwards and levels of disposable wealth increased along with opportunities to spend it. As the bodies were finally buried and the Black Death faded to become a horrific memory, periodically brought to life by cyclical secondary outbreaks, Southern Europe underwent change as well. In the 1370s, the Geno Genoese tried to take advantage of the terrible effect that plague had had on Venice, where suffering had been particularly acute, and attempted to wrest control of the Adriatic. The gamble backfired spectacularly. Unable to deliver a decisive blow, Genoa found itself suddenly overstretched and vulnerable. One by one, the appendages that the city-state had added over generations linking the city to the Middle East, the Black Sea, and North Africa were picked off by rivals. Genoa's loss was Venice's gain. Freed from the attentions of its long-term competitor, Venice now soared as life returned to normal, exerting a vice-like grip on the spice trade. Pepper, ginger, nutmeg, and cloves were imported in increasing quantities, above all via Alexandria. On average, Venetian ships were bringing back over 400 tons of pepper per year from Egypt, as well as shipping considerable volumes from the Levant. By the late 15th century, nearly 5 million pounds of spices were passing through Venice each year to be sold on at handsome profits elsewhere, where they were used in food, medicine, and cosmetics. It also seems to have been the main point of entry for pigments used in paintings, often referred to collectively as Venetian goods from overseas. These included literally um, green from Greece, vermilion, uh, lead tin, yellow, uh, bone black, and a gold substitutive form known as purpur purpurinus or mosaic gold. The most famous and distinctive, however,
was the rich blue that came from lapis lazuli mined in Central Asia, the golden age of European art, of Fra Angelico and P Piero della Francesca in the 15th century, and then of artists like Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael, and uh, Titian owed much to their ability to use colors drawn from pigments that were part of the extension of contracts with Asia on the one hand, and the rising levels of disposable wealth to pay for them on the other. Um, and of course, uh, the green from Greece was verdigris. Um, of course, trade missions to the east were so lucrative that the Republic auctioned them off in advance, guaranteeing payments while devolving market, transport, and political risks to the successful bidder. As one Venetian put it proudly, galleys set off from the city in all directions to the coast of Africa, uh, to Alexandria, to the Greek lands, to the south of France, and to Flanders. Such wealth flowed into the city that Palazzi shot up in value, especially in the best locations near the Rialto and St. Mark's Cathedral. With land rare and expensive, new techniques were used in the construction of buildings, such as replacing spectacular but indulgent double courtyard staircases with smaller stairwells that required less space. Nevertheless, said one proud Venetian, even formal merchants' his houses were lavishly appointed with gilded ceilings, marble staircases, balconies, and windows fitted with the finest glass from nearby Murano. Venice was the distribution point for European, African, and Asian trade par excellence, and had the trappings to show it. It was just, it was not just Venice that flourished, so too did the towns dotted along the Dalmatian coast which served as stopping points on the outbound and inbound journeys. Ragusa, modern Dubrov Dubrovnik, saw extraordinary levels of prosperity in the 14th and 15th centuries. Disposable wealth quadrupled between 1300 and 1450, spiraling up, spiraling up so quickly that a cap on dowries was enforced to stop payments that were rising rapidly. The city was so awash with cash that steps were taken partially to abolish slavery. In times of such plenty, it seemed wrong to hold fellow humans in bondage and not to pay them for their work. Like Venice, Ragusa was busy building its own trading network, developing extensive contacts with Spain, Italy, Bulgaria, and even India, where a colony was established in Goa, centered on the Church of St. Blaise, Ragusa's patron saint. Many parts of Asia saw a similar surge in growth and ambition. Business boomed in southern India as trade with China built up alongside that from the Persian Gulf and further afield. Guilds sprang up to ensure security and quality controls, but also to create a monopoly that obstructed the rise of local competition. These guilds concentrated money and influence in the hands of a self-seeking, self-selecting group of main, who maintained a dominant position on the Malabar coast and in Sri Lanka. Under this system, commercial relations were formalized to ensure transactions were done efficiently and fairly. According to an account written by the Chinese traveler Ma Huan in early 15th century, prices between buyer and seller were set by a broker. All taxes and duties were calculated and had to be paid in advance before goods were released and shipped. This made for a good long-term trading prospect. The people there are very honest and trustworthy, Ma Huan ad added. That was the theory at any rate. In fact, the towns on the southern coast of India did not operate in a vacuum and competed with each other fiercely. Cochin emerged as a rival to Calicut in the 15th century after an aggressively competitive tax regime su succeeded in attracting considerable trade. This became something of a virtuous circle as, as it caught the eye of the Chinese. A series of major expeditions led by the great Admiral Xing He, a Muslim eunuch, to demonstrate China's naval power, assert its influence and gain access to long-distance trade routes deep into the Indian Ocean, the Persian Gulf, and the Red Sea, paid special attention to building up ties with the ruler of Cochin. These missions by Xing He were part of an increasingly ambitious set of measures taken by the Ming dynasty that replaced the Mongol Wan rulers in the middle of the 14th century. Lavish funds were spent on Beijing, building an infrastructure to supply and defend the city. Considerable resources were devoted to trying to secure the steppe frontier to the north 
and on competing with a resurgent Korea in Manchuria, while the military presence to the south was built up with the result that regular tribute missions began to arrive from Cambodia and Siam, bringing local specialties like and luxury items in considerable quantities in return for the promise of peace. In 1387, for example, the kingdom of Siam sent 15,000 pounds of both pepper and sandalwood, and then two years later, ten times that amount of pepper, sandalwood, and incense. Widening horizons in this way, however, had its costs. Zing He's first expedition involved some 60 large ships, several hundred smaller vessels, and nearly 30,000 sailors, representing a very substantial outlay in terms of pay, equipment, and the extensive gifts sent along with the Admiral for use as tools of diplomacy. This and other initiatives were paid for by a sharp rise in the production of paper money, but also by increasing mining quotas, which led to a trebling of revenues from this sector in just over a decade after 1390. Improvements in the agricultural economy and tax collection also produced a sharp uplift in proceeds for the central government and stimulated what one modern commentator has described as the creation of a command economy. China's fortunes were helped by developments in Central Asia, where a warlord of obscure origins rose to become the single most famous figure of the late Middle Ages, Timurs, or Tamerlane. His achievements became celebrated in plays written in England, his savage aggression a part of modern Indian consciousness, forging a great empire across the Mongol land stretching from Asia Minor to the Himalayas from the 1360s onwards. Timur, or Timurlane's, uh, Embark, uh, embarked on an ambitious program to construct mosques and royal buildings across his realm in cities such as Samarkand, Harat, and Mashhad. Carpenters, painters, weavers, tailors, gem cutters, and short craftsmen of any kind, according to one contemporary, were deported from Damascus when it was ransacked to embellish cities to the east. An account by an envoy from the king of Spain to the Timurid court provides a vivid portrait of the scale of the construction and the level of ornamentation lavished on these new buildings. At the Aksaray Palace near Samarkand, the gateway was beautifully adorned with very fine work in gold and blue tiles, while the principal reception room was paneled with gold and blue tiles, and the ceiling is entirely of gold work. Even the famed craftsmen of Paris would not have been able to produce such fine workmanship. This was nothing in comparison to Samarkand itself and Tamur's court, which was decorated with golden trees with trunks as thick as might be a man's leg. Among the golden leaves were fruits, which on closer inspection turned out to be rubies, emeralds, turquoise stones, and sapphires, along with large, perfectly round pearls. Tamur was not afraid to spend the money he exacted from the peoples he subjugated. He, he bought silks from China that were the finest in the whole world, as well as musk, rubies, diamonds, rhubarb, and other spices. Caravans of 800 camels at a time brought merchandise to Samarkand. Unlike some people, such as the inhabitants of Delhi, 100,000 of whom were executed when the city was taken, the Chinese did well from Timur. It seemed, though, that they would be the next to suffer. According to one account, Timur spent time reflecting on his early life and concluded that he needed to atone for acts like pillage, the taking of captives, and massacre. He decided that the best way to do so was by mounting a holy war against the infidels, so that in accordance with the dictum, good deeds wipe out bad deeds, those sins and crimes might be forgiven. Timur suspended relations with the Ming court and was on his way to attack China when he died in 1405. The problems did not take long to materialize. Fragmentation and rebellion broke out in the Persian provinces as Timur's heirs jostled to could take control of his empire. But more structural difficulties were unleashed by a global financial crisis in the 15th century that affected Europe and Asia. The crisis was caused by a series of factors that resonate 600 years later, oversaturated markets, currency devaluations, and a lopsided balance of payments that went awry. Even with the growing demand for silks and other luxury products, there was only so much that could be absorbed. It was not that appetites were sated, sated or that tastes had changed. It was that the exchange mechanism went wrong. Europe in particular had little to give in return for the fabrics, ceramics, and spices 
that were so highly prized. With China effectively producing more than it could sell abroad, there were predictable consequences when the ability to keep buying goods dried up. The result has often been described as a bullion famine. Today, we would call it a credit crunch. In China, state officials were not well paid, which led to regular corruption scandals and extensive inefficiencies. Worse, even when correctly and fairly assessed, taxpayers could not keep up with the irrational exuberance of a government that was keen to spend on grandiose schemes on the assumption that revenues would only ever rise. They did not. By the 1420s, some of the richest parts of China were struggling to meet their obligations. The bubble had to burst, and in the first quarter of the 15th century, it did. The Ming emperors raced to cut costs, calling time on improvements to Beijing, suspending expensive naval expeditions and projects like the Grand Canal scheme that, at its height, employed tens if not hundreds of thousands, constructing a water network to connect the capital with Hangzhou. In Europe, where data is more plentiful, deliberate efforts were made to deal with the contraction by debasing the coinage, although the relationship between the shortage of precious metal hoarding and fiscal policy is a complex one. What is clear, however, is that global money supplies ran short from Korea to Japan, from Vietnam to Java, from India to the Ottoman Empire, from North Africa to continental Europe. Merchants in the Malay Peninsula took matters into their own hands and struck a crude new currency out of tin, of which there was a plentiful local supply, but put simply the precious metal supply that had provided a common currency, linking one side of the known world with the other, albeit not always in standard unit, weight, or fin fineness, broke down and failed. There was not enough money to go around. It is possible that these difficulties were made worse by a period of climatic change, famine, unusual periods of drought, coupled with cases of destructive flooding in China, tell a powerful story of the impact that environmental factors had on economic growth. Evidence some sulfate spikes in ice cores from the northern and southern hemispheres suggests that the 15th century was a period of widespread volcanic activity. That this triggered global cooling with knock-on effects across the steppe world where intensifying competition for food and water supplies heralded a period of dislocation, especially in the 1440s. All in all, the story of this period was one of stagnation, hard times, and a brute struggle for survival. The effects and ramifications were felt from the Mediterranean to the Pacific, fueling a growing sense of unease about what was going on in the world. Although the rise of Timur's empire had not provoked widespread fear in Europe, the rise of the Ottomans certainly made increasingly anxious many. The Ottomans had swarmed across the Bosphorus in the late 14th century, delivering crushing defeats on the Byzantines, the Bulgarians, and the Serbs, and establishing themselves in Thrace and the Balkans. Constantinople was left hanging by a thread, a Christian island surrounded by a sea of Muslims. Passionate pleas for military support from the royal courts of Europe went unanswered, leaving the city dangerously exposed. Finally, in 1453, the imperial capital fell. The capture of one of the greatest cities of Christendom, a triumph from Islam, which was once again in the ascendant. In Rome, there were accounts of men crying and beating their chests when news came through that Constantinople had fallen, and of prayers being offered by the Pope for those trapped in the city. But Europe had done too little when it mattered. Now it was too late. The fate of Constantinople was the source of acute concern in Russia, where it was seen not so much as heralding a Muslim resurgence as marking the imminent end of the world. There were long-standing Orthodox prophecies that Jesus would come at the start of the 8th millennium and sit at the Last Judgment, and these seemed to be on the point of being fulfilled. The forces of evil had been unleashed and had delivered a de devastating blow to the Christian world. So convinced were senior clergy that the apocalypse was at hand that a priest was sent to Western Europe to find more specific information about precisely what time of day it would take place. Some decided that there was no point in calculating the dates when Easter and other movable holy feast days would fall in the future, on the basis that the end of time was about to arrive. Based on the Byzantine calendar that was used in Russia, the timing seemed to be crystal clear. Using the date of the creation as 5,508 years before the Christ, the world was going to end on the 1st of September, 1492. Uh, on the other side of Europe, there were others who shared the conviction that Armageddon was fast approaching. In Spain, attention focused on Muslims and Jews, at time growing religious and cultural intolerance. The former found themselves expelled from Andalusia 
by force of arms, the latter issued with an uncompromising order to convert to Christianity, leave Spain or be executed. Desperate to liquidate their assets, a fire sale ensued with property scooped up by investors who picked up vineyards in exchange for pieces of cloth as estates and fine houses were sold for a pittance. What made it worse was that within a decade these bargains were to soar in value. Many Jews chose to head for Constantinople. They were welcomed by the city's new Muslim rulers. You call Ferdinand a wise ru ruler, uh, Bayezid II purportedly exclaimed, treating the arrival of Jews in the city in 1492, even though he impoverishes his own country to enrich mine. This was not simple point scoring and scenes which would be amused many today, but which evoke the early days of Islam. Jews were not just treated with respect, but welcomed. The new settlers were given legal protection and rights, and, and in many cases were given assistance to start new lives in a strange country. Tolerance was a stable feature of a society that was self-assured and confident of its own identity, which was more than could be said for the Christian world, where bigotry and religious fundamentalism were rapidly becoming defining features. One example of a man who fretted over the future of the faith was Christopher Colon. Christopher Colon. Although by his own calculations there were still 155 years to go before the second coming, Colon was outraged that little more than lip service was being paid to matters of religion by the faithful and was particularly appalled by Europe's lack of concern for Jerusalem. With a fervor border, bordering on obsession, he drew up plans to launch a new campaign to liberate the holy city while at the same time developing a second fixation about the precious metals, spices, and gems that were so abundant and cheap in Asia. If only it were possible to get better access to them, he concluded, they could in turn easily fund a major expedition to liberate Jerusalem. The problem was that being based in the Iberian Peninsula, Peninsula placed him at the wrong end of the Mediterranean and made his grand idea a little more than a pipe dream. Maybe, just maybe, there was hope. There were, after all, the voices of astrologers and cartographers like Paolo Toscanelli in Florence, who had argued that a route to Asia could be found by sailing west from the edge of Europe. After a titanic struggle to convince others to share a vision which bordered on the reckless and foolhardy, Christopher Colon's scheme finally started to become concrete. Letters of greeting were prepared for the great Khan, with a blank space to be filled in once his exact name was ascertained. He was to be an ally in the recovery of Jerusalem. Interpreters were recruited so that it would be possible to converse with the Mongol leader and his representatives. Specialists were hired who knew Hebrew, Chaldean, related to the Aramaic spoken by Jesus and the disciples, and Arabic, the language that was thought likely to be most useful for dealing with the Khan and his court. As one scholar notes, rising anti-Muslim sentiment in Europe meant that just as Arabic was being frowned on and prohibited by law in the Old World, it was also considered the best way to communicate when Western Europe finally connected with the Far East. Three ships set sail for Palos de Frontera in southern Spain on the 3rd of August, 1492, less than a month before the end of the world was being anticipated in Russia. As he unfurled his sails and set off into the unknown, little did Cologne, more f familiar as Christopher Columbus, realize that he was about to do something remarkable. He was about to shift Europe's center of gravity from east to west. When another small fleet under the command of Vasco da Gama set out from Lisbon, France, Lisbon, Portugal, five years later on another long voyage of discovery, rounding the southern tip of Africa to reach the Indian Ocean, the final pieces necessary for Europe's transformation fell into place. Suddenly, the continent was no longer the terminus, the end point of a series of silk roads. It was about to become the center of the world.